you ever going to play a Paul or a play like a regular old dude name? Paul. That's a, that's a cool guy name. Is it? I mean, well. Paul's a cool guy. Look at you. Is it within your range to play a regular dude? I'm not, I don't think so. I am <laughs> about as regular as they come, I think. Hey y'all, welcome to Tea with Paul G, the talk show where we want you to do what you love, do good for others, and have fun at it. Now, today I am joined by neither a hot tea hottie nor an iced tea hottie, but rather the show's first naughty hottie. Why? Because this guy doesn't like tea. Boo! Boo! <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. We, we, we love him anyway because he is a kind soul and he's a man of many talents. As a gifted writer, he's published a book of poetry and prose entitled Leather and Glass, which shows his emotional depth and wisdom beyond his years. And as an actor, he's played a variety of roles, including the yard boy turned rent boy in Purity Falls and the ideal boyfriend turned drug dealer in Evan Wood. But he is most well known for playing Jason Blossom on the hit show Riverdale. So without further ado, Mr. Trevor Steins, it is tea time. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course. I appreciate you being here. Mm -hmm. mm. So I got to say, that's an awesome suit. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, this is uh, inspired by you, actually. How so? You have a very lovely navy suit that I've always been very envious of, so when I had to pick up one for myself, I was just trying to match the look as well as I could. I think you did a great job. To be honest, I think these pants are from that set. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, the ones that I'm wearing. So apparently, yeah, we, we, we didn't plan this, but it's all about the blue today. You know, I asked you on the show, and you're like, well, I don't like tea. Mm. So uh, we won't talk about what's actually in that cup, but I'm glad you're here nonetheless. You're a great guy. I couldn't imagine doing this without you. So thank you for being here. Oh, wow. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was saying before we started rolling that we have been friends for a long time now, probably like five or six years. Yeah. And that is entirely by virtue of your ability to make and maintain friends. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because like we, we met at some event in, in Burbank I think years ago, yep. and, but I think you invited me to your birthday straight yeah. after that. Yeah, and so I I came, and the rest was history. But uh, I was just joking around that like I I can barely keep the friends that I have, let alone make new ones. So <laughs> I, I think you're. Well, yeah, I've always that's something I've always admired about you is that you are just super compassionate and and amicable and friendly to people you don't even know. I, I like to think that I'm a good judge of character. When I meet someone and enjoy their company and I feel like there's a connection, I like to maintain that, pursue it. Thank you for sticking with me. Can't get rid of me. <laughs> awesome, man. I guess you're having a premonition because you've already foretold our next segment, which is Spill the Tea. So to piggyback on that, yeah. The event that we met at originally, it was a Collider event yes. in Burbank. They were recording, was it one of the Schmodown yeah, Spectaculars? It was the, or? Uh, I don't know if it was the Spectacular, but it was uh, the movie trivia Schmodown. And those, for those who don't know, it's a movie competition show or a movie trivia competition show where uh, people come in and they compete and they uh, go fun, knowledge, fun. Yeah, knowledge to knowledge about like who knows more about movies and who can play the game better. And, um, a really fun show, really great show that had been going on for many years. And I was invited by some people that I knew at Collider to just come and, and watch the show. And yeah, that's, that's where I met you. It's a really sad timing, actually, because they, they just announced that the Schmodown was ending. After movie, nine seasons, which yeah. Which I'm still recovering from. I, I watched the Schmodown, like, yeah. religiously. I've always loved the show, and yeah. it's just a real bummer that they're, they're ending it. Yeah, congrats to Christian Harloff and Mark Ellis for amazing nine seasons. Um, but as far as our meeting, it was at the crafty table. Yeah. Do you remember? I mean, <laughs> I mean that's a usually where foodies I... bonding over. Oh, what are you having? Yeah, how's this? Yeah. Is this good? You know, that's, that's usually where I spend most of my time when I'm on any kind of set. Uh -huh. I just uh, and buy the food. That's where I can usually be found. All about that crafty. One of the first things I'm curious about, since we're spilling tea, you're a big fan of musicals. I am. Now, the last time we talked about favorites, The Greatest Showman was up there. I mean, I like The Greatest Showman film. Yeah. My favorite musical is probably still Into the Woods. Uh, mm. Sondheim. Mm. Uh, it was just like that was. It was kind of my introduction to the world of musical theater because I, you know, I, I grew up doing it in in school, like middle school and high school, um, and that was in Olympia. Of, yes, yeah. yeah, in Tumwater, Washington, the Tumwater Olympia area. And I remember my theater director had us watch Into the Woods. We didn't perform. We didn't do the show in school, but he was a big Sondheim guy. Uh, he loved all of Sondheim stuff, so we watched as a class uh, Into the Woods, and I just loved awesome. it, and I still do. 
Yeah, I mean, if you're talking musicals, Sondheim, I mean, that's yep. pretty high bar that's yeah, set yeah. there. Have you ever done any Sondheim shows? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Favorite roles? I mean, that's the thing is that, like, I, when I was in school, they, they didn't really give me any uh, prominent roles in any of the musicals and stuff. Um, yeah, it's kind of ironic going from being in the general ensemble for many yeah. years in, in my high school days to then actually pursuing a professional acting career. Hamilton, is that up there on your list? Oh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. love Hamilton. Let's talk about Purity Falls a little bit. Oh, God, okay, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. um, because you played Jason in Purity Falls, you're Jason on Riverdale, and uh, other characters like Brett and Josh, and yeah, like, yeah. all these like cool guy names. Are you, are you ever <laughs> gonna play a Paul or a play like a regular old dude name? Paul, that's a, that's a cool guy name. Is it? I mean, well. Paul's a cool guy. Look at you, is it within your range to play a regular dude? I'm not, I don't think so. <laughs> I am about as regular as they come, I think. Well, I know you got range. The different roles you've played. Mm -hmm. um, I know you and I have had some funny conversations before about filming scenes of intimacy and there's a lot in Purity Falls. Like, what's your approach to that? Like, uh, uh, there's different comfort levels for everybody and people ask me sometimes like, Oh, when you do those scenes, is it like, is it sexy? What is that like? And I'm like, I'm like, no. I'm like, you're surrounded by a bunch of yeah, people. I was gonna say, you know, it's hard to feel sexy with like a hundred people all staring at you and like a makeup artist like <laughs> getting in there while you're like doing a scene with another person. The director's trying to get a shot and everything like yeah. that. Yeah, I don't know. Um, as far as like my approach to scenes like that goes, it is an interesting thing to confront as an actor, like learning to be comfortable in your own body and learning to be comfortable like with another person uh, as like a scene partner. And I think that's like the biggest thing that I focus on. But it's always, I kind of just go based off of the person that I'm shooting a scene with. Like, I just wanna make sure that everybody feels as like safe and protected as they can if, if that's what they want. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it's, a scene like that is kind of the same with any other scene. It's, it's a collaboration between multiple people who all have different ideas and you just want to make sure that uh, people feel protected and people feel okay. Of course. When I was doing that that, that show on cable where I had a lot of intimate scenes, right. th it was before actually the introduction of the role of intimacy coordinator, but uh, mm -hmm. when did you film Purity Falls and was there an intimacy coordinator on set? Uh, Purity Falls was in 2019, 2018. S so yes, you probably um, and I don't I don't believe we had an intimacy coordinator. I don't, I don't recall that. Um, well, knowing you and how considerate of a person you are, and like you said, the way you make sure you talk to your scene partner and everything. I mean, you guys were on the same page to fulfill that role between yeah, the two of you. Yeah, I I, I hope so. Um, yeah, I just try to, like I said, make sure. I, I it requires like consistently like checking in with the people you're working with and, and making sure everybody feels good about what they're doing, you know? Yeah. So here we are having tea. I do want to ask you about this, uh, this infamous teacup moment that Jason Blossom had. My understanding is you were joking between takes, oh, yeah. but they ended up using it in the broadcast. Yeah, yeah, in a recent episode of Riverdale was a scene of my character, Jason and his sister Cheryl and their mother, they were having breakfast. We had these cups of tea on set as just part of the breakfast spread that we were having in the scene. Yeah, just in between takes of my coverage of this scene, I, I just thought it'd be funny to like, do the like Leonardo DiCaprio like toast to the uh huh from the gas with the champagne yeah, he does exactly, the thing from the you... Great Gatsby yeah toast to the camera and, and drink because apparently they were rolling which I didn't know but yeah, uh, yeah. yeah it was it was in between takes just it as a joke and then I saw the episode and it was in there <laughs> and I was like I was like oh all right well well I I feel like too like especially for everything that your character has gone through and how he's you know, brought back in the sideline story of River Vale and all that stuff. Um, I feel like it, it works for that character to have a moment like that where I'm gonna break the fourth wall and you know, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it adds to this um, feeling of kind of hyper reality, which I think um, Riverdale and more specifically like the character of Jason often falls into, right? Where especially, especially in that episode, Cheryl was having a, a nightmare and that's mm -hmm. kind of how she um, sees me. And so it has <laughs> this like sort of ethereal, like otherworldly feeling to, yeah, to like you said, kind of have a fourth wall breaking moment yeah. um, directed towards Cheryl. Uh, you have a lot of those moments where they have that, 
ethereal feel, you know, or the you know, nightmarish kind of vibe, just some haunting, cool moments. And yeah, yeah, it goes with the. I think goes with the territory of playing a character who's dead. Yeah. Speaking of your character being dead, I love how like you're in a lot of season four, but it's the prosthetic that they created, right, of the corpse. Mm. The the makeup artists on on that set are, are very talented. They just slather me in prosthetics and makeup, <laughs> and um, then spray me down with this like uh, topical glue to just to hold everything together. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun, though. I love getting to play dress-up, essentially. That's the fun thing about what we do. We get paid to play professional dress-up. But, I mean, that's a light way of putting it, but I know sort of emotional depths that you have, like, and you are a true artist, that it goes deeper than that. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that, yeah. I try, you know. That's all I can really say. Okay, so i got to ask, Riverdale, huge show, very popular. Clearly, you auditioned for it. Agent manager called said, hey, go in and... You know, but I want to hear it directly from your perspective. Yeah, yeah, it was actually very much that. I, I remember, it's kind of funny thinking back, uh, I was having a rancid day oh. um, that whole day. Like, I was walking home in, like, the 95-degree, you know, L.A. heat. Uh -huh. um, I was walking home from the doctor, and I had, like, hurt my hand. And the doctor was, had told me that, like, I wasn't going to be able to, like, do things that I like doing for, like, <laughs> you know, a month. And I was like, that is awful news. Yeah. So I was, like, in a bad mood, and I was, like, walking home, and I was sweating. And as I was walking home, I, I got a call from my agent, and they were like, hey, we have this audition for you. They we want me to put it on tape, and it's due in an hour, which is not... A common thing, you know, it's a, you usually have a little bit more time to prepare. But it happens. It does happen, yeah. and it happened to me. Yeah. And I was just so frustrated, <laughs> and I was like, fine. And I go home, and I lived. I was living with roommates at the time, but nobody was home to, like, help me film. Mm. Um, and I didn't have, like, a tripod set up or anything, so I, like, took my phone, and I, like, pulled the our, our dining room table into the living room and, like, stacked a chair on top and set up my phone and I like pulled in all the lamps from all over the apartment <laughs> just to try and get like some semblance of lighting yeah. and it just like wasn't working and I was super frustrated and just pouring sweat. It took a second, I stopped and I was like, okay, I'm just gonna take a quick shower, I'm gonna rinse off. Yeah. I changed and I just did the audition by myself. I like put, you know, leaned up my phone and I shot a couple takes of it and I sent it to my agent. I was like, which one of these do you like? He was like, this one, we sent it off. And the next day I got the call that wow. I had booked the show, yeah. See, that's a really good story because <laughs> I love the ones where it's like, it happened last minute, I threw it together. There wasn't even a callback, I just booked it, yeah. you know, yeah. off a of tape, not, not a in-person audition, you know. I love stories like that. And those were, for me, I always look back and I'm like, there's such a enjoyment about that side of it when it just happens, so. Yeah, yeah, it's like the, it's like the good and bad thing about this job and this industry, right? Is that, like they say, a single phone call can change your life, right? Yeah. And you never know when it's coming. Well, hey, you know, you went from uh, a hurt hand in 90 something degree weather to not having a great day to the next day. Well, you got it. Yeah. So that's pretty good turn of events. Yeah, yeah. And then like, you know, a week or two later, I was filming up in the mountains of Canada in like this beautiful location on a river. And yeah. Yeah, it was a ton of fun. But yeah, when your character first appears, it's a bunch of beauty shots, and there's this brother-sister bond, and where is it going? And then, boom, it takes that turn. Yeah. And I feel like pretty much from that point on moving forward, it's been all the, the, the nightmarish, the kind of yeah, yeah. haunting kind of visuals. Tell me about shooting. You, you shot in a tank for the scene where you, uh, you appear to Cheryl and you have the bullet wound, right? Yeah. Have you worked in water before? What was that like? Uh, I hadn't before. Um, and it was a really, really fun experience, actually. We, uh, Madeline and I, we got together with, like, a scuba instructor before filming, and we just, like, learned the basics of, you know, kind of shooting underwater. We had, you know, air tanks and everything. Mm -hmm. um, learned about the dangers of the bends. That's where you ascend uh, faster than the rate of your air bubbles, and it does something to your blood? Yeah, yeah, it, like, oxygenates your blood, or, yeah. like, over-oxygenates it, or... There's a danger of like air in your lungs expanding too fast mm -hmm. and it can like rupture your lungs or something like Oof. that. I'm um, not a scuba expert as you can <laughs> tell, uh, but I, I have a little bit of training. And yeah, and so then we got together for filming. They had this um, pretty much like a, a huge shipping container 
with the top cut off that filled with oh, water and we okay, just cool. we went under and I couldn't see anything so I just had to kind of judge it looked dark <laughs> yeah it was but it was effective like yeah, yeah. the final shot turns out great yeah and that was the tough part was having like kind of the zombie Jason yeah makeup on uh -huh. being completely submerged in water um, like like I was saying before they just sprayed me down with like six layers of this glue yeah. just trying to hold it all together and we would like finish a take, come up, and they'd like look at me and like try and figure out right. how to just keep this makeup together to finish filming. Uh, it was, yeah, it was a fun experience. So as far as the training leading up to that then, yeah. it wasn't like you actually had to get a scuba certification, it was just learning techniques and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, just basically learning how to operate the, the mask and the tank and um, how to be safe doing underwater yeah. work, you know, underwater filming and acting. That's good stuff. Love your work on Riverdale, of course, but I also love your work right here. Can we talk about the book a little? Yeah, sure. I'm curious, talk about the process of putting something like this together and like the, the inspiration even. Sure, yeah. Came about. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, it, it's kind of an odd thing, like going from being like a professional actor and, and um, kind of defining yourself that way to then Try, like trying to adopt a new label as, as a writer. I am an artist, as, as nebulous as a term as that is. Um, and I kind of believe in this idea of creativity being like an internal force that um, artists have. Sorry, it sounds kind of corny, but like- Not at I, all. I always I... think of creativity as, as kind of a drive and a, an internal force that expresses itself and it like finds a way to channel itself into various things, whether it be like writing or acting or art or dance or anything like that. Um, it's always just, it comes from this drive within people. And then it's all just about finding how to uh, give that drive an outlet, right? And for me, for, for the most part, like predominantly it's been my work as an actor. And uh, I don't know, the thought just occurred to me that like, you know, if I'm, if I'm writing, kind of in my spare time that I should try and like just put it all together, you know, and I don't know, it, it feels like almost, maybe maybe this is just my own like self judgment. Um, I hired an artist for the cover and I, yeah, I decided on the, the design and the, the colors and I did all the like editing myself because the book's been out for a couple of years. Um, you know, I think like as a creative person, your, your tastes and your ideas and your thoughts change with time and you know I always say that if I were to do it again um, it would probably look a lot different. That's the interesting thing is like yeah uh, just like your taste buds change over time so do your tastes in other ways as you mentioned um, yeah. and ideally we evolve and grow as right, human exactly, beings exactly. and as artists and yes I call you an artist I use that word because for that very reason that you just explained, you know, you, you have that inside you, like, and, and I, I feel it too. It's like when you're an artist and it's your passion, there's this thing inside you that compels you to create yeah. because for whatever reason, it, it, it's, you have to, or you wither. I mean, that's how this show came about. It right. started as a productions were shut down in 2020, the pandemic, there was nothing going on. And the artist in me was like, what am I going to do? Well, I started going back to drawing. I used to love to draw. And then this idea popped into my head and I was like, okay. And then, so here we are now. Yeah. So what I love about this is there's a story, there's an arc, you know, sure. there's a lot of heartbreak, but there's, there's hopeful moments too. Is the heartbreak from one person? Is it a collection of experiences or, or what? Yeah, you know, it's writing poetry and I think it probably is true for writing anything like you draw inspiration from moments in your life and experiences you've had. And for me, it's like rarely a one-to-one -one translation of this thing happened to me and this is what I'm writing about, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in, in Leather and Glass, it's really more of a writing experience of distilling this lifetime of, of experiences that I've had uh, and like emotions that I've gone through and kind of what it feels to be a human being, you know? Like, I think the human experience is so it's funny because it's so universal, but it's always so hard to define. Mm -hmm. um, and I think trying to figure out in my own life what that has meant for me to kind of go through the process of, you know, at times like falling in love and then being broken by that and then coming out of that and healing and looking towards the future. Um, I think that's really what I wanted to 
that's the message I wanted to get across in that relate my experiences to other people so that they might feel like seen or understood by it, or at least feel less alone. I introduced you as a kind soul, but you're also an old soul, really. <laughs> like, you're still a young man, but yeah. you, you read this book and it does feel like he's lived a life, like <laughs> more so than you would think for your age. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. It's, yeah. um, you know, I, I do feel like that's something that I, I've heard, you know, even since I was a kid. Um, some people have described me that way, and I have no idea if it's true at all. I, you know, I, I don't want to sound too pretentious, but um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I like I said, I, when you are trying to funnel that creative force uh, into a medium, you can only ever like tell the truth. You know what I mean? I think, and I say something akin to that in the book that um, that you can never really lie as an artist. At least you can't lie and, and find any success in it. Absolutely. I mean, that's the foundation of acting, right? Is to find the honesty mm -hmm. to make those moments real. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, people people have joked with me before that like being an actor is being a professional liar, and I always say that being an actor is being a professional truth teller. So. I love that. You're passionate about what you do, and I love that. Yeah. You, you're doing what you love, and we're about that. So, I, I think there's there, there's a big difference in pretension and comfort in knowing yourself right. and you know the path that you're on yeah so I think we should roll on into our next segment which is positivity do you have any advice you'd like to give viewers or that you give people when they ask for advice the mantra I always like repeat to myself is remember the human mm. you know what I mean in all things like whether you are dealing with other people or even just having a hard time with yourself you know, I always just try to say that, remember the human, remember that you're just a, a human being and everybody else that you are coming in contact with, are, they're just people who are trying. Um, and everybody, everybody fails and succeeds and everybody hurts and loves and laughs and lives. <laughs> Live, laugh, love. I love that. <laughs> I mean, it is about the human experience, you know, we're, yeah. we're in this together. Right. Like, I used to go through life like this, and it, that, it was what was in front of me, what I was all about, that was all that I saw. But sure. I'm not perfect. Nobody is. Yeah. The, perfection's a myth. Exactly. But, but yeah, I mean, I, li I like to think that I've grown. And that's the whole point, right? Like, it's just, it's just keeping in mind the, the human aspect of everything. People mess up, and, and nobody, is, nobody is perfect, and that doesn't really mean anything. So what's the best advice you've ever been given? I remember my theater director in high school, uh, he once said, Every story is a love story. For some reason, that has always stuck with me through my life and, and especially through my career, I think, through my artistic endeavors. Yeah, just that idea. Every story is a love story. It's a lot yeah. of love out there. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for all the insight. Good stuff. I think we should move on into our next segment, which is charity. And this is where you, sir, will have the opportunity to play my trivia game, 50-50. We're going to give you 50 seconds on the clock. You'll have the chance to earn $50 for the charity of your choice, which is? The Trevor Project. The Trevor Project offers free 24-7 counseling for LGBTQ youth who are in danger. So very, very important stuff. Let's uh, hope you can get all 50 for that. Oh, God. Nothing shuts my brain off like a timer. I don't know why. Like, you put a clock on me and... And I just completely turn off. What's, I won't even remember my own name. Well, don't even worry about it. It'll be, <laughs> I'm not going to have it right in front of you. It'll be off camera or whatever. And all you got to do is just focus on this trivia, which okay. you, I think you'll be good at because, you know, Riverdale, based on a comic series. Yes. Trevor Steins, a, a big fan of comic books yeah. in general. Huge comic book nerd. So that's what your trivia is all about. Oh, thank goodness. Comic book trivia. Here we go. And uh, all of your answers are going to start with the letter. T. Mm-hmm. Clip. Oh, thank you. I'll take it. Okay, so here's the thing. Okay. Your timer will not start until after I finish my first question. Okay. And if there's something you want to skip, just say pass. Okay. We'll circle back if there's time. Oh. Are you ready, sir? I hope so. 50 seconds on the clock, please. I hope, I hope I don't lose my, like, nerd credentials for not getting any of these right. Ready? I love trivia. Okay. In Marvel Comics, Black Panther is the alter ego of blank of Wakanda. T'Challa, formerly his father, King T'Chaka. Oh, he, yes, all right. Robin, Raven, Starfire, and Beast Boy are some of the members of this group of DC heroes. Uh, Titans, or Teen Titans. There you go. Depending on the iteration, anyway. Oh my God, yeah. 
He knows it all. All right, from Batman's Rogues Gallery, the Mad Hatter's real name is Jervis Tetch. Blank. Sorry, Tetch. Tetch. All right. In the Archie comics, Blank Blank, the ice cream parlor owner, is lovingly called Pop. Oh, man. This is where I... You hit me with an Archie. This is Let's move on to the next one. We'll come okay, back. Okay, pass, 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 pass. IDW Publishing is home to this three-issue horror comic miniseries about vampires flocking to Alaska to take advantage of the lack of sunlight there. Is it... Uh, I don't know. Pass. Uh, okay, in the Archie comics, blank blank, the ice cream parlor owner is lovingly called that's Pop. It? Yeah, oh that's five. We're I just know this pops. Um, pop tape, pop tape. Yes. Woo! Awesome. Sh- we'll take that. You salvage that one right at the end with pop tape. Oh my god, uh, I don't know why. Tape was the answer we were looking for. Um, IDW Publishing is home to this three-issue horror comic miniseries about vampires flocking to Alaska to take advantage of the lack of sunlight there. Anybody? 30 days of night. 30 days of night. That's great, man. Four out of five. 40 bucks for the Trevor Project. Oh, man. Good job, man. I That pop tape one's going to haunt me forever. I should have ah. known that immediately. It's time to roll into our next segment, which is activity. I was thinking for this one, since I know you're a foodie and I know your favorite cookie, so I was thinking we should have some of those sandwich cookies and kind of rate and review the different ways they are enjoyed. I would <laughs> like to hear your favorite way. I'm gonna okay. share a few of mine I've taken note of. So uh, if we could please get some sandwich cookies and uh, yeah, I'd love a glass of almond milk. Thank you, this is producer Matt. He's doing an amazing job. Thank you for that. Thank you so much, man. Ah, and cookies for me too. Thank you, sir. All right. Okay, so um, for me, I mean, there's the clear, obvious choice. Pick it up, eat the whole thing. Okay. Oh, my turn. Mm-hmm. Your style, too, is like, I'm gonna eat the whole thing. Here, let me have it. You wanna wash it down? Mm. My next one, this is actually my most common one. I like to twist, and I'm a little type A, so I try to, oh, that's pretty good. It's so close, I almost got it perfect, but I usually twist, and then I take spare side, give it a little dunk. Fair enough, there's less cream there. Then the creamy side's left, and they get away. Or scrape with your teeth. <laughs> How's this for ASMR? <laughs> I apologize to anyone out there suffering from misophonia. <laughs> is it gonna kill you if you're wearing headphones? I don't know what that is, misophonia. It's like a uh, condition where you essentially have like really negative reactions to certain like small sounds. Like for some people it's like- Nails on chalkboard. Clicking pen. For a lot of people mm-hmm. it's like chewing sounds. Mm. Oh yeah, this is it. There are three proper ways to enjoy a sandwich cookie. Amazing, <laughs> like you, you clearly put thought into this. Yes, yes I have. Anybody who knows me knows. Uh, I am a sandwich cookie aficionado. Yes you are. But uh, as you said, there is the uh, tried and true just eating the thing wholesale, mm-hmm. um, which you know I'm a fan of because I've got a big mouth and it's gotta be useful for something. <laughs> Method two is similar to you. Twist and pull apart, and then you can uh, then you uh, eat the pieces separately. It's just a different ratio of cream to cookie, mm-hmm. right? And then method three is what you did is you completely separate the segments of the cookie into two halves and the cream. Right? Not a clean job there, but and then you eat the two halves mm. just as the cookie, just as the mm. nice chocolatey deliciousness. That's a good idea. And at any point, you might dip at your leisure. And I think I will. This is surprisingly enjoyable. Like I didn't know I was gonna have this much fun just eating cookies. This is pretty much how I spend every Saturday night. <laughs> Um, so, a number I learned from my brother. Uh, he'd have his after school cookie snack. You have multiple cookies available, obviously. He'd have his, his beverage of choice. He would take one cookie, just let it rip. Just, just drop it, them in. And it's gonna sit and soak. Ideally, it sinks to the bottom and sits and soaks in the beverage while he enjoys the rest of his cookies and then he has a nice tasty treat waiting at the bottom of his glass oh, when man. he's ready. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to give that one a thumbs down. <laughs> Like, I'm gonna get killed for this, but there's nothing worse than a soggy cookie. Okay. I'm sorry, I can't do it. You got it here, folks. Trevor Stein's not, not a fan of a soggy cookie. Yeah. Alternatively, another thing you can do if you're really wild. Let's get wild. I mean, we're uh, drinking tea. You can. It's wilder than that. I don't know if you guys knew you could do this. This is actually legal. You can actually take multiple halves with cream, put them together, and make we'll make a cookie here. That's perfect, because it's my last two cookies to make. Oh, yeah. Trev, thank you for sharing your cookie expertise with us. On that note, having eating on a talk show, uh-huh. not, not the best super idea. conducive to the talking part. Since we uh, have finished our activity, we're going to roll on into publicity. For 
we let you go, could you please let everybody know what you got going on and where to look for you? You guys can uh, follow me in all my artistic endeavors. You know, I'm, I'm doing the social media thing, so I'm on Instagram at Trevor underscore Steins. Um, and you guys can catch me on Riverdale. Good stuff, man. All right, that brings us to our last but not least segment, audience participation. Which is where I thank you all for watching and invite you to win a prize from the show. So if you'd like to participate, please let us know how you think my wardrobe today was inspired by our guest. We will go through all the correct answers and we'll pick a winner before the next episode drops. In the meantime, please like, subscribe, share, comment, all the good stuff, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Dude, thanks for being here.